Hi guys, this is Dr. Piri taking you in human physiology. So today we'll be looking at uh, circulatory system. So the circulatory system is composed of the cardiovascular system and the lymphatic system. So by now, I hope you appreciate physiology of the blood. So in certain textbook, physiology textbook, you'll find that physiology of the blood is just a component of the circulatory system. That's why we started by looking at physiology of the blood. <clears throat> With that information, now I know that you're ready to start another system. So for today, we'll just look at the circulatory system, but you know to say, before you go into the physiology, you need to appreciate the anatomy because you know, you have to know what you're dealing with for you to understand the function. So you need to understand the structure before you go to the function. Because you know to say when you're talking of anatomy, basically you're looking at the structure of these organs and the cells and the components of these organs. But when you're talking of physiology, basically you're looking at the function of these organs or these systems. So we'll start by just looking at the general anatomical function of the circulatory system. Then in lecture two, that's where we're going to go in detail now looking at the physiology of the circulatory system. So there will be a series of lectures that we'll look at, but today is just the introductory lecture. So this is more like the introduction to circulatory system. So this is circulatory system lecture one. What we're going to look at in this class, we just have the general intro introduction to circulatory system. Then from there, we'll look at the vascular anatomy of the circulatory system, and then the functional anatomy of the heart. So this is just basically anatomy, but we are not going in details, just basic anatomy for you to appreciate the physiology later on. So <clears throat> since it's a new unit, you need to understand the unit objectives. So these are the unit objectives. It means that at the end of this unit, you should be able to understand certain things. You should be able to do certain things. So what are the unit objectives that we have in circulatory system? So the first one, as a student, you should be able to describe the functional anatomy and components of circulatory system. Then from there, you should be able to compare the structure of an artery and the vein and be able to explain how the structure of each type of the vessel relates to its function. So these blood vessels have differences in terms of the structure. So how is an artery different from a vein? And why are they different in terms of the function? Then you should be able to describe the cardiac cycle, which is a must. And then you should be able to describe the structure and the function of the conduction system of the heart, including the recording and the interpretation of electrocardiogram. So we'll look at the ECG. So you should be able to understand how the ECG is recorded and how you can interpret results from the ECG. So this ECG sometimes is also referred to as EKG. So EKG is the same as the ECG. Then you should be able to describe some common arrhythmias that can be detected with an ECG. So using the ECG, we'll be able to detect certain abnormal heart rhythms, which are called arrhythmias. Then you should be able to explain the relationship between flow, pressure, and resistance in the vascular system. So these are the hemodynamics of the circulatory system. So you need to understand this hemodynamics of the circulatory system. Then you should be able to define shock and its major cause. So there are a lot of causes of shock and there are different classifications of shock. So you should be able to define what is shock and what is causing it. Then the final one, at the end of this unit, you should be able to describe the components and the functions of the lymphatic system. So the major parts of this circulatory system will spend much time looking at the cardiovascular system because there's a lot of information with regard to the cardiovascular system. Then we'll dedicate a bit of time looking at the lymphatic system because it's also a major component of the circulatory system. So you also need to understand, but there is a relationship between the cardiovascular system and the lymphatic system because they work in collaboration. So we'll look at the interrelationship between the cardiovascular system and the lymphatic system. 
So let's start with the introduction now. So this is just the general introduction to circulatory system. What you need to know is that the circulatory system consists of two subdivisions, like I said. So you have the cardiovascular system, which is composed of the heart and the blood vessels. That's why it's called cardiovascular system. Then the other system is called the lymphatic system. So these two systems will form the circulatory system, the cardiovascular system and the lymphatic system. So like I said, the cardiovascular system consists of the heart and the blood vessels. So the heart, which is called the cardia, and the blood vessels. That's why this system is called cardiovascular system, the heart and blood vessels. But the lymphatic system consists of the lymphatic vessels, the lymphoid tissue within the spleen, the thymus, tonsils, and lymph node. So you have the lymph nodes, the lymph vessels, and also the spleen and the thymus. So these will comprise of the lymphatic system. So it's not a big system that will waste much time on it. We'll just spend a few minutes on it. So now the diagram that you're looking at, this is just a summary of the cardiovascular system. So you can see at the center here, you have the heart. Then from the heart, you have these blood vessels that are coming from the heart. So this diagram is just showing the major blood vessels. So under normal circumstances, it's not this simple. There are a lot of blood vessels that are not shown in this diagram. So this is not an ideal diagram to look at blood vessels. This one is more ideal, it's showing more of the blood vessels. So this is <clears throat> what you need to understand. Say you have the heart at the center, then you have major blood vessels, and then you also have smaller blood vessels. So this is called the cardiovascular system. On the other hand, we have the lymphatic system. So you can see the lymphatic system, you have the thymus, the spleen, the lymph nodes, and the lymphatic vessels. So this forms the lymphatic system. So within the lymph nodes, the spleen and the thymus, there is also differentiation of white blood cells, the lymphocytes that are involved in immunity. So you find that once they drain fluids from the tissue, then the lymph node will be able to fight pathogens. Sometimes you can have bacteria as my microbes or maybe viruses. Any pathogen they will be dealt with within the lymph node. So it's involved in cleaning of these fluids that are coming from the tissue. So it's going to cleanse the fluid that are coming from the tissue. And then later on after that, the same fluids will be drained back into the venous system to join the cardiovascular system. So here, you can appreciate the two systems, the circulatory system and the lymphatic system. And then on the other side here, you have the interrelationship between the systems. So this is the relationship between the cardiovascular system and the lymphatic system. So you can see there's the heart here, the veins and the arteries on the other side. Then at the center here, you can appreciate the lymph vessels and lymph nodes. So you can see from the tissues here, where you have the capillaries within the tissues. So you find that fluids can move from the capillaries into the tissues, and that fluid is called the interstitial fluid. Some of that fluid can, can move back to the cardiovascular system, to the venous side of the cardiovascular system, and some of the fluid will remain within the tissues. So that fluid that will remain within the tissues, if it's not drained by the lymphatic system, you find that there will be accumulation of fluid within the tissues that can result into edema. So the lymphatic system is involved to drain the extra fluids that remain within the tissues. Then it's going to clean the fluids because you have the lymph nodes, you have leukocytes or white blood cells. Then later on, the fluid will be released back to the venous side of the cardiovascular system. So you can see this connection between the lymph vessels and the major veins like the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava. So you have specific points at which these lymph vessels are going to connect back to the cardiovascular system. So to drain back the fluids that were drained from the tissues back to the cardiovascular system. Okay, so like I said, the heart is a four chamber double pump. Its pumping action creates the pressure head needed to push blood through the vessels to the lungs and body cells. So you need this blood to move 
the body cells. So how does this blood get to the body cells? Is by the action of the heart because the heart is able to pump. So it's going to create that blood pressure to propel blood to the tissues, then also to the lungs. So to the lungs for oxygenation of blood and also to supply the lungs with necessary nutrients and, and also other factors that are needed by the lungs. And also the body cells, they also need blood. So you find that the blood vessels, once the heart is pumping, it will push the blood into the arteries and then from the arteries it will go to the tissues via the capillaries. Then <clears throat> at rest, the heart of an adult pumps about five liters of blood per minute. So every minute the heart is pumping about five liters of blood. But you know to say that at this rate, it takes about one minute for blood to be circulated to the most distal extremity and back to the heart. What it means that on average, a normal person will have about five liters of blood. We covered that in blood physiology. So the, the normal amount of blood that a person should have on average should be five liters. So if the heart is pumping five liters in every minute, so it means that every minute that passes, blood will go into circulation back to the heart again. That's what that sentence means. So the blood vessels form a tubular network that permits blood to flow from the heart to all the living cells of the body and then back to the heart. The arteries will carry blood away from the heart, then the veins will retain blood to the heart. So what you need to know is that the major thing is the arteries, they will always carry blood away from the heart. So be it the pulmonary arteries or the systemic arteries, they are always carrying blood away from the heart. Then the veins, they are carrying blood to the heart. So they are going to retain blood back to the heart for it to be pumped up in again. So you, you can have pulmonary, uh, pulmonary vein that are coming from the lungs after oxygenation of blood, and then it will go to the left side of the heart, then it will be pumped into the systemic circulation. Then you also need to know that both the pulmonary vein and also the systemic vein, they are carrying blood back to the heart. So you can have the inferior vena cava, the superior vena cava that are taking blood back to the heart. And then you can also have the pulmonary uh, vein that is also taking blood back to the heart. So the major thing is that the arteries, they are always carrying blood away from the heart and then the veins, they are carrying blood back to the heart. So the arteries and the veins are continuous with each other through the smaller blood vessels. So at some point, there is a connection between the venous system and the arterial system. So between the venous system and the arterial system, you have smaller blood vessels, which are called capillaries. So the capillaries are the ones that will join the arterial side to the venous side. So that it's, it's a circuit which is complete. So from the tissues, you have the capillaries that will drain into the venous side, the venous side will retain the blood back to the heart, then the heart will pump blood back to the tissues, then from the tissues there it will go through the same capillary network, then it will join to the venous. So this is just a continuous kind of blood vessels. So as blood plasma, which is the fluid portion of the blood, passes through the capillaries, the hydrostatic pressure of the blood forces some of these fluid out of the capillary walls. So you know to say that within the blood vessels, you have blood plasma. And this blood plasma is the fluid portion of the blood. So because you have the fluids within the cardiovascular system, they are going to create hydrostatic pressure. So it's the pressure due to the presence of water molecules. So this hydrostatic pressure will start pushing these fluids away from the cardiovascular system. So since they are being pushed against the capillary walls, we find that the fluids will start moving now from the cardiovascular system into the tissues. Okay, so this is facilitated by the hydrostatic pressure. So the hydrostatic pressure is moving fluids from the cardiovascular system to the tissues. But you need to know that there is also oncotic pressure due to the presence of plasma proteins that will retain fluids within the cardiovascular system. So there are two forces here. By looking at the hydrostatic pressure and oncotic pressure, you'll be able to know how these fluids will move. 
whether they are moving from the cardiovascular system to the tissues or from the tissues to back to the cardiovascular system, depending on the values of hydrostatic pressure and oncotic pressure. So I'll explain that again later on. So this fluid, the fluid derived from plasma that passes out of the capillary walls into the surrounding tissues is called the tissue fluid or the interstitial fluid. So the fluid that is moving from the cardiovascular system into the tissues, it will join the tissue fluid or the interstitial fluid. So the interstitial fluid is the fluid that is found in between the cells. So you can have cells surrounded by the interstitial fluid. So as this fluid is moving to the tissues, it can also move with it uh, a lot of nutrients and also oxygen to the tissues. And then after metabolism with the tissues, you have metabolic waste that needs to move back to the cardiovascular system to be transported maybe to the kidneys, to the lungs, to the kidneys for excretion of these uh, metabolic waste products and also to the lungs for oxygenation. So some of these fluid retain directly to the capillaries, like I said, and then some enter, some enters into the lymphatic vessels located in the connective tissues around the blood vessels. So within the connective tissues around the blood vessels, you have the lymphatic vessels that will drain now the extra fluids that will remain within the tissues. That is very important. Why? It's because once you have blockage of lymphatic vessels, there will be accumulation of fluid that can result into edema. But the fluid that is found within the lymphatic vessels is called lymph. So lymph is basically fluid that is found within the lymphatic vessels. So this fluid is retained to the venous blood at specific points. So lymph nodes positioned along the way cranes the lymph prior to, the, to its retain to the venous blood. So you know to say before this lymph is retained back to the venous blood, it needs to be cleaned. So the lymph vessels are the ones that are involved in cleaning of these fluids that are coming from the tissues because you have a lot of white blood cells. So the lymphatic system is therefore considered as a part of the circulatory system because it's also involved in circulation of these fluids within the body. So this table here or the diagram here is showing what is happening within the arterial system in the venous system. At the center here, you have the capillary. So what you're looking at here is a capillary. So the capillary has got two ends. You have the arterial end of the capillary and the venous end of the capillary. And then surrounding it, you have the tissue cells. So you can see the tissue cells here, the tissues. So like I said, as blood plasma is moving towards the arterial end of the capillaries, it has got so much hydrostatic pressure. And this hydrostatic pressure will start pushing the fluids against the capillary walls. So they will be able to move, this fluid will move across the capillary walls to go into the tissues. It could be due to osmosis. So it's moving due to osmosis from high water molecules to low water molecules via a semi-permeable membrane, or just because of this hydrostatic pressure that is pushing the fluid out of the cardiovascular system. So this fluid, as it's moving to the tissues, it will move with it oxygen and nutrients that are required by the tissue cells. Then the tissue cells, they will undergo metabolism using these nutrients and also oxygen to undergo metabolism. And this metabolism will result into production of waste products like carbon dioxide and other metabolites. So carbon dioxide and other metabolites, they need to move back to the cardiovascular system for it to be transported to the organs that are involved in excretion or gaseous exchange. So how do this fluid move back to the cardiovascular system? It's because as you are moving from the arterial capillary end to the venous end, you find that the hydrostatic pressure will start reducing but the oncotic pressure will increase due to the presence of plasma proteins. So once you have an increase in oncotic pressure, that will now attract water molecules back into the cardiovascular system. So as these water or fluids are moving back to the cardiovascular system, it will also move with it other meta metabolites or metabolic waste and carbon dioxide back to the cardiovascular system, and then it will be transported by the, the venous system back to the heart, then to the kidneys. 
Then at the same time, you need to know that this fluid that is moving from the cardiovascular system into the tissues, not all of it is moving back to the cardiovascular system here. So there is extra amount of the fluids that will remain, that will remain within the tissues. So that extra amount of fluid that remains within the tissues is the one that will be drained by the lymphatics. This is where the lymphatic system comes in. So you have the lymphatic vessels here that will drain the extra fluid then back to the venous site after cleaning of this fluid by the lymph nodes and the other structures like the spleen, and then it will go back to the venous circulation. Okay, so this diagram is just summarizing the cardiovascular system. So you have two major circulation here. When you're looking at the cardiovascular system, so you have the pulmonary circulation and the systemic circulation. The pulmonary circulation, you're looking at blood that is transported to the lungs for oxygenation and then goes back to the heart. Then from the heart, blood will be pumped into the systemic circulation to the tissues. So these are the major circulation systems that are that are involved. So you can see here, this is a table that is looking at the summary of the pulmonary and the systemic circulations. So you have the pulmonary circulation and systemic circulation. So this is just basic information that most of you already know by now. So you have the source of these circulations, the arteries, this is the arterial system, and this is the venous system. And then also looking at the oxygen content of the arteries and the oxygen content of the veins, then the termination of this circulation. So you can see from here that the source of pulmonary circulation, you have the right ventricle, so the source of pulmonary circulation, so this is the pulmonary circulation that I'm talking about. So where is it coming from? It's coming from the right ventricle here. This is where you have pumping of deoxygenated blood after you have uh, the, the, the superior and the inferior vena cava that is taking blood back to the heart and then to be pumped by the ventricles into the pulmonary trunk and the pulmonary trunk is going to divide into the pulmonary artery. So you have the left pulmonary artery and the right pulmonary artery. So the origin of these arteries are coming from the right ventricle, as you can see here. And then the major arteries that are involved here, these are called pulmonary arteries. Then the oxygen content in these pulmonary arteries, you know to say that you have low oxygen because this is the blood that is retaining from the tissue. So the oxygen has been used up and also the nutrients that have been used up by the tissue. So you have low oxygen content. Then when you're looking at the venous part of this system, you have the pulmonary veins. So the pulmonary veins are originating from the lungs itself. After, after these capillaries join to form the venues and then the venues will join to form the veins then you have these major pulmonary veins. So these major pulmonary veins now, they are carrying the oxygenated blood back to the heart. So the oxygen content within these pulmonary veins, you can see that it's very high. Why? It's because this is now after oxygenation of blood. And then the termination of the, uh, of, the, of the pulmonary veins within the left atrium. So you can see here, that these pulmonary veins, they're draining into the left atrium. And then from the left atrium, blood will move into the left ventricle and then it will be pumped into the iota to the systemic circulation. So this is systemic circulation. Systemic circulation, you can see from this diagram that is starting from the left ventricle. So you can see the source of the systemic circulation is the left ventricle. So from the left ventricle, the major arteries involved here are iota and its branches. So you have the iota in the major branches of the iota that are coming from the left ventricle. That's the origin. The oxygen content here, this is also after oxygenation of, of blood. So you have high oxygen content. Then the venous system, then you're looking at these veins that are returning back to the heart from the tissues. So you have the systemic venous system here mainly the major veins here, looking at the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. 
So you have the superior and the inferior vena cava in their branches. The oxygen content, the oxygen has been used, has been used up by the tissues, so you have low oxygen content. The termination is within the right atrium. So you can see here that they are joining to the right atrium, then blood will be pumped into the, uh, the right ventricle, then it will be pumped into the pulmonary trunk, then it will move again. So this is the complete cycle. So this is the circulatory system, the pulmonary and the systemic circulatory system. This slide, it's looking at the vascular wall properties. So the vascular wall properties, the wall of blood vessels, what are the properties and what is the major function of these vessels depending on the vascular property. So the vascular wall property. So you can see here at the center, you have the heart and then you have these major blood vessels that are coming from the heart. So on my right here, I have the arterial circuit. And then on the left, you have the venous circuit. So you have different types of these vessels. So when you're looking at the arterial circuit, these blood vessels that are near the heart, these are large arteries or large vessels. So you have the large artery and you have the large vein that are near the heart. And as you move away from the heart, you find that the diameter of these blood vessels will start reducing. So you can see here that the arterial circuit or the arterial system is high blood pressure system. Because it's high blood pressure system, you find that the walls of the blood vessels are larger as compared to the venous system. The venous system, because this is a low blood pressure system, you find that the wall of the, uh, of the veins, they are smaller as compared to that of the arteries. So you can appreciate that as you move away from the heart, even the diameter of the blood vessels will start reducing. So you have the large artery with a larger diameter or with larger thickness of the wall. And then as you move down, you have the medium sized artery with a smaller thickness of the wall. So you can see it's reducing here until you reach the arterioles. The arterioles, they are a bit different from the capillaries, but here you can also see that the thickness of the wall has reduced so much that when you are approaching the, uh, the capillaries, you only have a single layer of cells. So you can appreciate the reduction in the diameter or the thickness of the wall. Then here, same, Prices here, so you can see that there's reduction in the thickness of the wall as you move away from the heart, but the veins, they also have the valves in them. So you can see this medium-sized vein in the venules, they have a lot of valves. Why? It's because the venous system, I've already said that this is a low blood pressure system. Excuse me. So if it's low blood pressure system, you need the valves that is going to prevent backflow of blood. So as blood is moving, sometimes this blood that is moving within the veins would want to go back. So that is going to be pre prevented by the valves that are found within the veins. And the other thing that you need to note here is that the arteries, they are carrying blood away from the heart to the tissues. Then the venous system is carrying blood from the tissues back to the heart. So the arterial system carries oxygenated blood, and then the venous system carries deoxygenated blood. So there is an exception here when you're looking at the pulmonary arteries and the pulmonary vein. So the pulmonary artery is the only artery that carries deoxygenated blood. And the pulmonary vein is the only vein that will carry oxygenated blood. So those are just two exceptions that you need to know when you're comparing the arteries and the veins. Okay, enough of that, just let's look at the wall of blood vessels in terms of the layers of the wall of the blood vessels. So you have the structure of blood vessels. So you have three layers which are called tunics. So the tunics, you have three layers. You have tunica intima, tunica media, and tunica externa. The tunica intima, you're looking at the innermost layer of blood vessels. 
So the innermost is composed of the endothelium, the endothelium aligning the lumen of blood vessels. So you can see that this layer of cells that are aligning the lumen of blood vessels, they are called endothelial cells or endothelium. Then after the endothelium, you have the subendothelial layer. So you can see this subendothelial layer. Then after that, you have the internal elastic membrane. So the internal elastic membrane is all associated with the artery. You don't find the internal elastic membrane within the, the veins. So it means that the arteries are elastic as compared to the veins. Why? It's because you have this special type of protein which is called elastin. It will form the elastic membrane of the arteries. Then after that, you have the tunica media. So the tunica media is found between the tunica interma and the tunica externa. That's why it's called the tunica media. This is where you find a lot of smooth muscles. The smooth muscles, so you have more of the smooth muscles within the arteries as compared to the veins. So this is going to allow the arteries and the veins to, to have those properties of vasoconstricting and vasodilating. So you have vasoconstriction and vasodilation because of the smooth muscle cells. They can contract, they can relax, depending on the factors that are stimulating them. Then again, when you're looking at the arteries, you have the external elastic membrane. So you have elastin again. So the elastin in between the two elastic membrane, you have the smooth muscle cells. But in in, in the veins, you don't find the elastic membrane. Then the last or the outermost layer is called the tunica externa. This tunica externa is composed of adventitia. So the adventitia, you have this tissue matrix that can, that can facilitate the blood vessels to attach to the surrounding structures. So this is just, the cross section of the blood vessel wall and appreciating the layers. So just a bit of information that we've already looked at. So you have the, the intima. The intima is the innermost layer and is primarily a single layer of endothelial cells that are standing on the basement membrane that line the lumen. So you can see a single layer of cells that is just standing on the basement membrane. So this is called the tunica intima or the intima. So this tunica intima, it's very important to maintain the integrity. Why? It's because you know to say that the endothelial cells, there are a lot of things that are producing that will maintain the fluidity of blood that is moving within the lumen of blood vessels. So like I said, the health and the integrity of the cell layer is important as they provide a non-thrombogenic surface for the blood flow. So you know to say within the endothelial cells, the membrane of the endothelial cells, there are a lot of things that are associated with it that will help to maintain the fluidity of blood that is moving within the blood vessels to prevent um, blood clotting because if there's no injury, you don't want clots to form. So you find that there are certain proteins that are produced by the endothelial cells. For instance, you have the prostacycrine. The prostacycrine is a special prostaglandin that will inhibit the activation of platelets. Then the endothelial cells, they can also produce nitric oxide. The nitric oxide can also inhibit activation of platelets. At the same time, they also have heparin sulfate. The heparin sulfate is also an anticoagulant, so it will inhibit activation of certain factors. Then at the same time, the, the, the heparin can also activate another enzyme, which is called the antithrombin-3. The antithrombin-3 can bind to the heparin, and this antithrombin-3 can inhibit the activation of thrombin, and at the same time can also inhibit the activation of certain factors, like factor 2, factor 5, and factor 10. So you find that the antithrombin is inhibiting the activation of those factors. Hence, it's going to inhibit coagulation cascade. At the same time, you also have other proteins like thrombomodulin. The thrombomodulin can bind with thrombin and form the thrombomodulin-thrombin complex. And this thrombomodulin-thrombin complex can activate 
protein C. So the activated protein C can also inhibit other clotting factors like factor five and factor eight. At the same time, it's also involved in digestion of the clots that might just form within the cardiovascular system. So all this information we've already covered. So you know to say that the integrity and the health of endothelial cells is very important because this is going to provide a non-thrombogenic surface for the blood flow. So like I said, these endothelial cells is also involved in, it will sense changes in the flow and the pressure and release signaling molecules. And these signaling molecules such as nitric oxide and endothelium. The nitric oxide, like I said, it's also involved in inactivation of platelets so that you don't have activation of platelets. Then at the same time, the nitric oxide can also cause relaxation of smooth muscle cells. So there is a mechanism which is called endothelial derived relaxation of smooth muscle cells. What is involved here is the nitric oxide. The endothelial cells can produce the nitric oxide, and this nitric oxide can move across the plasma membrane of the endothelial cells and then also the plasma membrane of smooth muscle cells. Remember, after the endothelial cells, you have the tunica media, which is composed of mainly smooth muscle cells. So if this nitric oxide is produced by the endothelial cells, it will move to the smooth muscle cells. Within the smooth muscle cells, it will go and activate an enzyme, which is called guanylocyclase enzyme. And once the guanylocyclase enzyme is activated, it's going to convert GTP into cyclic GMP. The cyclic GMP will activate a protein kinase, and this protein kinase will inhibit contraction of smooth muscle cells. So you have relaxation of smooth muscle cells that will result into vasodilatation. Then you can also have the production of endothelin one. So the endothelial cells can also produce endothelin one. And this endothelin one is involved in stimulating smooth muscle cells to contract. So it's a strong vasoconstrictor. How? It's because once you have production of endothelin, it will go to the smooth muscle cells. It will go and bind to the endothelin receptors. That will result into a cascade of reactions that will mobilize a lot of inositotriphosphate. And this inositotriphosphate will go and mobilize calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum that will bring about smooth muscle contraction, as we've already discussed that. You know, to say the, the mechanism that is involved in smooth muscle contraction. Once you have mobilization of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, it will go and bind to camodulin. The calcium camodulin complex will go and activate an enzyme, the mouse in night chain kinase, that will phosphorylate the mouse in heads. Once the mouse in heads are phosphorylated, it will bring about interaction between actin and mouse. In. That will bring about a contraction of smooth muscle cells. So it, it will bring about vasoconstriction. So when you have vasoconstriction, the diameter of blood vessels will reduce, minimizing the amount of blood and also increasing blood pressure. Then you have the middle layer, which is the tunica media. So the middle layer is called media, which is comprised of concentric layers of smooth muscle cells and elastin, which forms the elastic lamella. So these smooth muscle cells will provide the ability for the artery to contract or dilate. So you have vasoconstriction, vasodilatation for the arteries, depending on what is stimulating these smooth muscle cells. And then the outermost layer of the arteries is called the adventitia. So this is just the outermost layer of blood vessels. You have adventitia, which is comprised primarily of collagen and fibroblasts. So you have much of collagen and fibroblasts. And you know to say collagen is also involved in, in cell adhesion molecules. So you find that the blood vessels are able to attach to the surrounding structures because of this collagen and fibroblasts. Then larger blood vessels like the iota, they also have vasa vasora. So the vasa vasora, these are tiny, tiny blood vessels that supply the larger blood vessels. So you know to say that larger blood vessels, they have the thickness is so big to the extent that those cells inside them, the smooth muscle cells and endothelial cells, they also need blood supply. So you find that 
you have smaller blood vessels that are supplying the wall of larger blood vessels. So these smaller blood vessels, they are called vasa vasola. It's a Latin word. That means vessel of vessels. So vessel of vessels, vasa vasola. Then moving on to the functional anatomy of the heart, as you can see from this diagram here, the heart is pumping blood to the systemic circulation and pulmonary circulation. So how does this heart function like this? So you just need to appreciate the functional anatomy. So today we are just looking at the structure of the heart. We are not going to the physiology. So later on, we're going to the physiology. So the major function of the heart is pumping of oxygen-rich blood to every living cell in the body. So each and every living cell in the body, it requires blood because within the blood, this is where you find oxygen and nutrients. So each and every living cell of the body requires blood. And this blood is facilitated by the pumping action of the heart that will push it to the tissues. So the heart maintains the circulatory system. Why? It's because for this blood to propel within the blood vessels, it requires that blood pressure. And that blood pressure is created by the heart. So the heart maintains the circulatory system. Then at the same time, it's vital for hemostasis. The hemostasis, why you need platelets on that site of injury, you also need other factors, the clotting factors. So we find that the clotting factors are produced by the liver, majority of them, then they need to be transported by blood. But for this blood to move requires the pumping action of the heart. So it's also going to facilitate hemostasis and also homeostasis. How is by delivering nutrients to the tissues for normal functioning on the body cells or the body in general. Then they are also involved in transportation of waste products away from the cells. So about the size of the fist, the hollow cone shaped the heart is divided into four chambers. So there are four chambers that are found within the heart. You have the right and left, Atria, so atria means two or more. Then singular is called atrium. Okay, so we have atria, this is plural, atria, singular. So the atria receive blood from the venous system. So the venous system will load the blood into the atria. So you have two atria. You have one right atria and the left atria. Then you also have the other two chambers, which are called the ventricles. So you have the right and the left ventricles that pump blood into the arterial system. So the ventricles pumps blood into the arterial system. The atria will receive blood from the venous system. So these are the four chambers of the heart. So the right atrium and the ventricle, sometimes they are called the right pump. So they are called the right pump because they are located on the right part of the blood and they can work independent from the left atria, the left atrium and the ventricle. So it means that the left atrium and ventricle is also referred to as a left palm. So they are separated by a septum. So in between the left side of the heart and the right side of the heart, there is a septum that is separating these, uh, these chambers, the four chambers. So this septum normally prevents mixture of blood from the two sides of the heart. So you have two sides of the heart, the right side and the left side. So you don't want this blood to mix. Why? It's because these two systems, they have different content of oxygen. The left part, you have oxygenated blood. The right part, you have deoxygenated blood. So you don't want to mix this blood. So it's separated by the septum, but sometimes you can have septal defects. So this uh, defective septum, you can have a hole that can allow mixing of blood from the right part of the heart to the left part or from the left side to the right side. So that needs to be pre prevented. For instance, during embryo development, there is foramen ovary that will shunt blood from the pulmonary trunk into the iota because when the fetus is developing, the lungs are not functional. So it means that you need to divert the blood instead of this blood going to the lungs, it needs to go back to the iota. So you have the foramen ovary that is there to facilitate that movement of blood from the pulmonary trunk back to the iota and then it goes to the circulation, the general circulation. In certain individuals, we find that that 
filament of R doesn't close. And then most circumstances is supposed to close so that you don't have mixing of blood from the left to the right, but sometimes it can persist. So you can have patent ductus atriosus. So this patent ductus atriosus, it will persist to the extent that even if the baby is born, is born with that foramen, that will facilitate mixing of blood. And then it can bring about other issues. So it needs to be closed. So under normal circumstances, it's supposed to close to form ligamentum atriosus, atriosa. So ligamentum atriosa. So if it means patent, it's called patent ductus atriosus. So this is a diagram I'm explaining. So you can see here the polamin ovale here that is connecting the pulmonary trunk to the iota to facilitate movement of blood from the pulmonary trunk to the iota during fetal development. This is very important why it's because here at this level of development, the lungs are not fully developed. So you need to divert blood back to the iota so that less blood is just going to the lungs because they're not functional. So this just makes sense. So sometimes it can persist. Then you can have patent ductus atriosus that can still allow movement of blood from the pulmonary trunk into, into the iota or from the iota into the pulmonary trunk, depending on the pressures. So you know to say within the left part of the heart, you have high pressures compared to the right part of the, of the heart. So you find that blood will start moving now from the iota into the right side of the heart because here you have a high pressure system as compared to the right side of the heart. Okay, so proceed. <clears throat> so between the artery and the ventricles, there is a layer of dense connective tissue which is known as fibrous skeleton of the heart. So you have this fibrous skeleton of the heart that will separate the two atria from the two ventricles. So in between them, we have this tissue, the fibrous tissue, which is called fibrous skeleton of the heart. So bundles of myocardial cells in the atria attached to the upper margin of the fibrous skeleton and form a single functioning unit or myocardium. Remember the myocardium, they have a lot of gap junctions. So the fibrous skeleton of the heart is separating the atria from the ventricles. But the atria, they can communicate via gap junction. So it will form a single myocardium. So a single myocardium, why is because these cells, they will have sensitial functioning. To the extent that when you stimulate one cell, all the cells will be stimulated because they will just act as one myocardium. But this is separated from the ventricles. So the atria will contract on their own and the ventricles are also independent from the atria. So for the information to move to stimulate the ventricles, this is where the conductive system of the heart comes in to carry those action potentials. The myocardial cell bundles of the ventricles attach to the lower margin and form a different myocardium. So this is just showing you to say, the fibrous skeleton of the heart is separating the atria from the ventricles. So the atria, they are operating on their own and the ventricles are also operating on their own. So as a result, the myocardial of the atria and the ventricles are structurally and functionally separated from each other. So in terms of structure and function, they are separated. So you need a special conducting tissue that is needed to carry action potentials from the atria to the ventricle. So because they are separated by this fibrous tissue, so you need a special type of conducting tissue that will conduct the action potential from the atria to the ventricles. Remember the SA node is found within the right atria. So that action potential needs to be propagated to the ventricles for them to contract. So you need this conducting system. So the Conductive tissue of the fibrous skeleton also forms rings that are called annuli fibrosi. So you have these annuli fibrosi that forms around the four heart valves. So they are going to provide a foundation for support of the valve flaps. So you find that these valves of the heart, they are supported by this fibrous tissue because it's very strong. So it will form these rings and the rings are called annuli fibrosi that will prevent the backflow of blood because they're going to support the valves. 
So there are three types of cardiac muscle cells. By now you understand we covered these in muscle physiology. So there are three types of cardiac muscle cells. The first type, these are muscle fibers which form contractile unit of the heart. So these are the myocardium themselves that are involved in contraction. So they will contain a lot of myosin and actin protein filaments that are involved in contraction. At the same time, you also have another type of muscle fibers which form the pacemaker. So you're talking of the SA node, the sino or node. You have the pacemaker cells, the special types of cells that will generate spontaneous action potentials that will stimulate the, the atria and the ventricles to contract. So this is the source of an action potential. So they are called pacemaker cells. So these are special types of fibers that are found within the heart, the pacemaker cells. Then the last group of muscle fibers, these are muscle fibers which form the conductive system. So once the action potential is generated by the pacemaker cells, it needs to be conducted to the myocardium. So you have this conductive system that will conduct the action potentials to the myocardium. So you're talking about the atria and the ventricles. So there are special types of cells that will form the conductive system of the heart. This is just the general anatomy of the heart, the outside of the heart. So you can see this is the anterior aspect of the heart. We are looking at the front part of the heart. And then the posterior is behind there. So you can see the anterior aspect of the heart. There are a lot of things that you can appreciate here. So you can appreciate the two atria. So you have the right atrium and the left atrium. Then you can also appreciate the vena cava. So the vena cava, you have the superior vena cava that is draining structures from the head and the neck back to the heart. And then you also have the inferior vena cava that is draining blood from the rest of the body back to the heart. So you have the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava that will open into the, light, the right atrium then the right atrium will drain into the right ventricle. Then you can also appreciate the pulmonary trunk that is originating from the right ventricle. So the pulmonary trunk, it will divide into the right and the left pulmonary arteries. So you have these pulmonary arteries. Then here you can also appreciate the ligamentum atriosum. So this ligamentum atriosum, is just a remnant of foramen ovary. Then you can also appreciate the ventricles down here. So you have the left ventricle and the right ventricle. Then you have blood supply to the myocardium themselves. So you have these coronary supply to the heart. So you have the coronary arteries that are supplying the heart. Then you also have the coronary veins that are draining uh, blood from the ventricles. So you can see here, you have the right coronary artery, which is found in the right atrioventricular groove. So you have the right atrioventricular groove, a groove between the, the atria and the ventricles. It's called the atrioventricular groove. So you have the right coronary artery here, and then you have the left coronary artery that is also found in a groove here, in the left atrioventricular groove. Then this left coronary artery is the one that is supplying mainly the septum and also the left ventricle. So because it's the one that is supplying the septum and the left ventricle, if you have blockage of this artery, you're going to result into myocardial infarction. Myocardial infarction, this myocardial infarction, this damage to the blood cells, you can have ischemia or the myocardium here taking place, that will result into malfunction of the heart. So we'll discuss that later on. But you can see here again, you can appreciate from the left coronary artery that you have this branch which is called the circumflex, the circumflex artery. So you have the circumflex artery. This circumflex artery will go to the posterior side of the heart to go and supply tissues from the posterior side of the heart. So these are just structures. And then you can also appreciate the pulmonary arteries here. Uh, the pulmonary vein. Okay, so this is just the general structure of the heart, which by now you already understand. So the core section of the heart, you have the heart wall, just, just like we had the wall of blood vessels, you also have the wall of the heart, which is to some extent similar to the wall of blood vessels, but here it's a bit different. Why? It's because you have this layer of muscles. So 
you have a huge layer of muscles because the heart is designed to pump blood. So you need a lot of smooth muscle cells to contract for you to have, to create that blood pressure. So the outermost layer, you have the parietal pericardium. So the parietal pericardium is just a fibrous tissue that protects the heart from the out, outside or from the outside surroundings of the heart because it's found within the mediastinum. So you need the mediastinum, you have the lungs surrounding it and other tissues. So you need to protect the heart from those tissues. So you have this fibrous membrane, which is called the parietal pericardium. Then after the parietal pericardium, you have this membrane, which is called the visceral pericardium. So between the parietal pericardium and the visceral pericardium, you have a cavity here, which is called pericardial cavity, the space between the parietal pericardium and the visceral pericardium. The visceral pericardium sometimes is also referred to as epicardium. So within the pericardial cavity, you have fluids, and these fluids, they are going to lubricate the heart because you don't say the heart is involved in contraction in blood session, as it's pumping blood. So you need fluid to lubricate it to minimize on friction because if there's too much friction, there is damage to these cells. So it needs to be protected. So you have the fluid that is found within the pericardial cavity. But you need to know sometimes you can have excessive accumulation of fluid within the pericardial cavity, or you have infiltration of fluids within the pericardial cavity. That will result into a condition which is called cardiac tamponade. You have cardiac tamponade. The cardiac tamponade is as a result of accumulation of excessive amount of fluid within the pericardium or the pericardial cavity. That will result into compressing the heart. So you find that the heart doesn't relax well. It can't fill well with blood, so it pumps less blood outside. So the cardiac output will reduce because of cardiac tamponment. So you have cardiac tamponment. Okay, so going inside into the myocardium itself. So after the visceral pericardium or the epicardium, you have a lot of layers of smooth muscle cells. So these are muscle cells. So you have these muscle cells. The layer of these muscle cells is called the myocardium. But remember, this myocardium is not necessarily smooth muscle cells, but in terms of function, it's similar to the smooth muscle cell, but this is a cardiac muscle cell. So it's a cardiac muscle cell, so they are called myocardium. So this myocardium, the innermost layer of this myocardium, they are called endocardium. So you can see the endocardium that are lining the ventricles. And then you have the ventricles here or the atria. So this is just the layer of the heart. So just remember the outermost, the parietal pericardium. And then you have the visceral pericardium. In between the parietal and the visceral pericardium, you have pericardial cavity. And then after the pericardial cavity, you have this layer of myocardium or, or, or muscles of the heart, which is called myocardium, the myocardium, and then the innermost layer is called the endocardium. So this is just a layer of the heart, the heart wall. The heart's position in the thorax, so what is the position of the heart? It's located within the mediastinum, like I said, it's behind the, the sternum and pointing left, arterial to the vertebral column, lying on the superior surface of the diaphragm. The diaphragm is the dome, dome-shaped muscle that is separating the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. Then the heart is more left to the midline. So it's, when you're looking at the midline, the major portion of the heart is located to the left of that midline. In terms of weight, it weighs about 250 to 350 grams, which is about one pound. So you can see the location of the heart. Like I said, this is the midline. So the major structures of the heart is located on the left side of the midline. So this is the midline, it's more on the left, but it doesn't mean that you don't have structures of the heart on the right side of the median. So the heart is not just located on the left part of the body. It's just lying here, but it's more biased towards the left part of the midline. And then you can sit down here, you have this dome shaped muscle that is separating the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. Then, like I said, it's located within the mediastinum. The mediastinum is just here in between the two lungs, and then you have these blood vessels. 
Then you can also appreciate the diaphragm down here that is separating the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. So this is a, a, a person in a lying position. So the apex of the heart, you can see here, this is the apex of the heart. This is the cross section, and then you're looking on the top part of the heart. So this is the top part of the heart after a cross section. So you can see from here, or the superior part of the heart. So from the superior part of the heart, you can appreciate the base of the heart. So this is the base of the heart where you have these blood vessels coming from. Then you can appreciate the two atria, the left atria and the right atria. And then you have the ventricles, the left and the right ventricle. Then all those structures that we've already discussed. So still looking at the position of the heart. So you can see here the heart that is starting from the second intercostal space. So you have the first intercostal space and the second intercostal space. So this is where you find the base of the heart within the second intercostal space. Then it will go all the way to the fourth intercostal space. So you can see from the fourth intercostal space, you have the apex of the heart pointing to the left part of the body. So this is a left, this is a right. Remember, you're looking at the patient. So the, the, your, your left will be the right of the patient and your right will be the left of the patient. So you can see here that this is the left of the patient because this is your right part when you're looking at it. So this is the apex of the heart that is found within the fourth intercostal space. Okay, so I'm also going to highlight where you can do auscultation in percussions. So auscultation in percussions, you're talking about listening to the heart sounds. So there are specific points that we're going to appreciate where you can put your stethoscope for you to, to get the heart sounds. So this is just showing the outside of the heart. So you have the left border, the right border, the inferior border and the superior border. This is the base of the heart. The cross section of the heart, you can appreciate the ventricles and also the valves. So this is what you are looking at here. So mainly we have already looked at these blood vessels. So you have the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava that will open into the right atrium. So you can see the opening of the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava within the right atrium. So once blood moves into the right atrium, it will move down into the right ventricle via a valve. So between the right atrium and the right ventricle, you have this valve, which is called the bicuspid valve. So it's called the bicuspid valves because it will have three flips. So those flips, there are three, the flips, so it's called the tricuspid because there are three. So tri, tricuspid. So we have the tricuspid valve that will allow movement of blood from the right atria to the right ventricle. And this valve is supported by these strands or strings of fibrous tissue, which is called the corda tendine. So you have these cords that are supporting the tricuspid valves. And these cords will, will connect to the papillary muscles. So the papillary muscles can contract when the, when the ventricles are contracting. So they will give support to the valves so that they don't flip over into the atrium when there is build up of blood pressure within the ventricles so that blood is moved into the pulmonary trunk here. So after contraction of the right ventricle, blood is ejected into the pulmonary trunk via another valve. So you have another valve here, which is called the pulmonary semilunar valve. So you have this pulmonary semilunar valve that will allow movement of blood into the pulmonary trunk and the pulmonary trunk will divide into the right and the left pulmonary arteries that will carry blood to the lungs for oxygenation. Then after oxygenation within the lungs, blood will retain via the pulmonary veins. So you have the left and the right pulmonary veins and these pulmonary veins will open within the right and the left atrium. Within the left atrium, you can see the opening of these pulmonary veins. 
So this is now oxygenated blood that is moving to the left part of the heart. So the first part that will receive the blood uh, is actually the left atrium. Then from the left atrium, blood will move into the ventricle via the bicuspid valve. The bicuspid valve is also called the metro valve. So blood is moving to the ventricles and the bicuspid valves, they're also supported by the corda tendine and the papillary muscles, as you can see here. When the left ventricle contract after stimulation, there is a buildup of blood pressure that will push blood now into the aorta via another valve. So this is called aortic semilunar valve. It will open due to that pressure, then blood will be ejected into the aorta. The ascending aorta, then the descending aorta, and then it will go to the systemic circulation. So you see that these semilunar valves, they are called semilunar valves because they have these flaps that looks like half moon, hence the name semilunar. So semilunar valves. So like I said, there are four valves and four chambers. So you have the two atria, which are the two chambers and the two ventricles. Then on top of that, between the atria and the ventricle, you have these valves. So you have the tricuspid valves and bicuspid valves. Then between the ventricles and the pulmonary trunk and also the aorta, you have other valves, which are called semilunar valves. So you have the pulmonary semilunar valves and the aortic semilunar valves. So four chambers, four valves that are found within the heart. So these are the structure of the valves. So you can see from the right side of the heart, you have the tricuspid valve. So the tricuspid valves is between the atria and the ventricle. So it's also called the right atrioventricular valve. So the right atrioventricular valve because it's between the atria and the ventricle. So it's called tricuspid valves because when you're looking at these flaps, there are three. One, two, three. So you more like have three cups. That's why they're called tricuspid valves, tricuspid valves. Then on the right side of the heart, you also have the pulmonary semilunar valve. So this is the right part of the heart. This is the left part of the heart. So you have the pulmonary semilunar valves between the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk. So you have these semilunar valves, the pulmonary semilunar valves. So they look like half a moon. That's why it's called semilunar valve. Then on the left part of the heart, you have the tricuspid valve, or which is also called the metro valve, or the left atrioventricular valve. It's between the left atrium and the left ventricle. And it has got just two flaps. So these two flaps, they are called bicuspid. Bicuspid, you have two flaps. Then you also have valves that are between the aorta and the left ventricle. So these are called aortic semilunar valve. So you can see here. So these are the valves that are found within the heart. Then as these valves are closing, they will produce those heart sounds. So we'll know which ones will produce the first heart sound, the second heart sound. Sometimes you can also have the third heart sound or the fourth heart sound. So look at that. So this is just a diagram also looking at a detailed structure of the valves that are found within the heart. So you can appreciate the corda tendine. So these are cords that are attaching the flaps of the valves to the papillary muscles. So they're going to give structural support to the valves so that they don't flip over into the atrium when there is too much pressure that is building within the ventricles. So you can see their location here. So you have the tricuspid valve and the bicuspid valves here. The cardiac conduction system or the conductive system of the heart. So you can appreciate you have the sinoatrial node here. Then you have the internodal fibers that are not shown here. Then you have the atrioventricular node or the AV node. Then the bundle of his. So this bundle of his. So this is not pronounced as his. Is pronounced as his with a double S. So you have bundle of his that will bifurcate into two branches. So you have the left bundle branch and the right bundle branch of his. 
So these branches will bifurcate into the Purkinje fibers and the Purkinje fibers are the ones that are communicating with the myocardium, stimulating the myocardium to contract. So this is the conductive system of the heart. So you can see from this diagram here without the myocardium, so you have just isolated the conductive system from the heart. So you can see the sinoatrial node, this is the pacemaker of the heart. You have special types of cells that will discuss, they have special types of channels like calcium, sodium, slow channels that will allow depolarization of these cells and then they will generate an action potential once they depolarize the threshold. So it's, it's changing with time. So they don't have a stable resting membrane potential. So you have these sinoatrial node with those special cells. Then from the sinoatrial node, you have the three internodal fibers. So you can see here, the internodal fibers. And then you have this other fiber, which is called the Bachmann's bundle. The Bachmann's bundle is the one that is supplying the left atrium. So you can see from here, it will go and stimulate the left atrium. But even if you don't have this bundle here, the atrium are able to communicate twice because they have the gap junctions. But remember between the two atria, you have the septum. And the septum, at the septum, you don't have much of the gap junctions. Then from the sinoatrial node via the internodal fibers, they will transmit the action potential into the AV node, the atrioventricular node, then into the bundle of his, and then you have the bundle branch of his here. So you have the, the left bundle branch of his and the right bundle branch of his. So from the left bundle branch of his, you also have some branches of these cells or conductive system, which are called the left posterior bundles. So you have these bundles that are branching off from the left bundle branch of his. Then this will supply the septum of the heart and also some parts of the left ventricle. And then from here, you will see that they will divide into Purkinje fibers. And these Purkinje fibers are the ones that are communicating with the myocardium, stimulating the myocardium to undergo depolarization. And then later on, they'll be stimulated to contract. So this is just basically the same. But here you can see the movement of these action potentials from the SA node to AV node, and also via the Bachmann's bundle to the left atrium, then you have the, the bundle of his here that will bifurcate into two, the left bundle branch and the right bundle branch. And then these they will divide into Purkinje fibers that are stimulating the ventricles for them to contract. So from looking at this diagram, you'll see that the two atria will contract first. Then the AV node, you have special cells that will delay the conductivity of action potential. So there is a delay here within the AV node that will allow the two atria to contract, pushing blood into the ventricles. Then later on, the action potential will be allowed to move to the ventricles so that they contract after the two atria. So the ventricles now will contract to push blood into the pulmonary circulation and the systemic circulation. Pulmonary arterial circulation and the systemic arterial circulation. So this is just a summary of the functional anatomy of the heart. So this is where we're going to end this class. Then later on, we'll start looking at the other components of the circulatory system. So thank you very much for your time. This is where I end this class.